23 minutes past six, you're listening to the Nick Holt podcast on iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, and Audible. Just a reminder, you can also find that now on nickholt.substack.com. Well, tomorrow is, of course, Australia Day, a day of celebrations for some and a day of mourning for others. I think finding that middle ground between a national celebration and the recognition of what actually did happen to the Aboriginal people on January 26, 1788, to me it seems to have become increasingly difficult due to the politicised nature of this debate. Uh, On one side we have a rather loud and aggressive left-wing, if you will, cohort whose sole drive is to... uh, denounce Australia without celebrating it. And on the other side, you've got, I guess, a right, if we want to call it that, a far right, who who doesn't want to acknowledge that some of these horrible things happened. Warren Mundine is my guest here uh, tonight. Warren and I spoke earlier in the year about this, possibly last year, I should say. Uh, Warren's written extensively and very thoroughly on this topic. Warren is someone who both supports moving the date uh, of Australia Day, but also celebrating Australia Day. Warren, thanks for coming on again. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Nick. I guess my first question is: Do you agree with the assessment there in my monologue? Uh, yes, it's. I do, it, uh, and I, I base that, um, you know, if you're going to have Australia Day, Australians are not very jingoistic. They're not like in America where they've got flags all over the place and on their buildings and houses and everything like that. But we, we, we've got a lot to celebrate here. You know, we, you know, yes, we uh, got a, you know, a history, good and bad, and... Uh, and, and most nations in the world are the same. You know, I don't know any nation that was formed without, you know, uh, having wars or, or problems or anything, you know. And, and so, but the important thing for me is about, okay, it's not just about the history. We all should know the history and everything, but it's about how we overcome the, the, the bad things and how we keep on doing the good things. And so, uh, I look, I judge Australia pretty, pretty good on that. I reckon with the, you know, we've got Indigenous people, we've got uh, the colonists who come out here, we've got uh, British institutions, and we've got uh, and, and the migrants that come here, especially the millions of migrants who come after the Second World War, and really help kick along our co- economy. So, and we, we've got a lot to celebrate about that, and also, uh, you know, how we dealt with Aboriginal people in the 60s. We you know, got the full voting rights in 62. We got uh, the 67 referendum. And uh, within a short period of time, all, uh, 69, 1970, all the Aboriginal discriminatory laws were removed. And in, in another two years, you had Senator Neville Bonner, Bonner from Queensland in, in the Senate. And so, look, there's a lot of things to celebrate there, plus... When I was a kid, you, uh, I remember John Moriarty and uh, 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 Charlie Perkins come to our town and we were, I was only a young kid and all the adults were whispering about these young university students. And we were thinking, oh, what's a university? We, we don't know what a university was. And, but now... You, you know, you've got thousands of Aboriginals who have been for university and I think there's currently about 16,000 in uh, studying at the moment in, within universities. And so uh, that's a celebration. You know, we've got doctors and lawyers and engineers and a whole wide range of different people, and, and that's a, that's what we should be celebrating. And, and also the Aboriginal culture, you know, how we look at Aboriginal culture today and, uh, and, and write about it, put it in the history, and, that, and that, that's another celebration. Absolutely. I think it is an opportunity to... To celebrate that, I mean, I, you know, I, again, I, I think there's a lot to celebrate about this country, but I'm not convinced that there is such a thing as Australian culture in the in the sense that we're not as old as, say, the Chinese or the 
Europeans. <laughs> We're a very young culture, so we we have potentially we have um, a little bit of an identity crisis. And Australia Day maybe brings that out in some people. Uh, I think that most people just want to have a day off and and neck a few beers. To be honest, uh, yeah, typical Australians. We love we love our public holidays. That was one of the problems I had. When yeah. I, I thought that we have a recommendation that because Australia is 1901, the first of January 1901, which is uh, New Year's Day, and that's a public holiday already. And I didn't want to give up the uh, the Australia Day holiday. <laughs> that's right. And I'll read <laughs> I'll read that passage because I think it's 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 a good one. You wrote here uh, in 2019 on the Daily Telegraph. Uh, you wrote that if you follow my writing, you know I support moving Australia Day. To January 1st, the anniversary of Federation and the actual date on which Australia Day was founded. For me, 26th of January oh, signifies me, conflict um, and con- conquest. My wife's just on the, on the Oh, no worries. She's just gone on. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um, so you've, you've said here, basically, yeah, you want to move it to the, to the – you support moving it to the 1st, uh, the 26th to be commemorated uh, and kept as a public holiday. I think that's a good idea. Uh, yeah. It's, it's difficult, though, to have these sort of conversations because there's so much polarisation around this. Yeah, I think look, that, that's true. And I think, uh, I, th- I think we need to settle down a bit and, uh, and, and just acknowledge uh, the good and the bad of our history you know, and, and teach about it. And you know, and look at look. I uh, look at what uh, governments and that are doing today. Like in New South Wales, here there's something like five thousand Aboriginal kids uh, who are not only learning English, but they're learning uh, they're learning their own Aboriginal languages. Mm. Something like twenty five different Aboriginal languages in, in New South Wales. I think that's a positive step, and it's a positive step uh, of people who. You know, because language not, is not only just words, it actually ties you to your history, whether you're Italian, Greek or Aboriginal, and it ties you back to you, to your, uh, you know, to the, your country and your soil. And, and look, I see a lot of different migrants in that here who are very proud Australians, but, you know, you can see when they talk in their own language the pride that comes out. So yeah. I think that's a positive step and we need to cel- celebrate that. Uh, and, uh, I, and that's why I talk, and also the 26th is an uh, important day. It's always going to be an important day because we can't ignore it. That was the day that Arthur Phillip sailed into Sydney Harbour and really set up the colony and moved forward. Now, there are a lot of Australians who are descended from that. Uh, a lot of them didn't want to be in a boat. They were in chains and were brought out here. Mm. Uh, so, and, and they're proud of their history and they're proud of their uh, you know the, the, the survival and, and how they move from convicts and in, 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 uh, into the Australian society, and, and so it's uh, so, so that's always going to be a day that we have to acknowledge. You can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. Where do you see it going from here? Well, look, uh, the problem you have when you look, I had to put up an idea, and, and that. I think it was shot down with the air flames, but it was. Uh, it, it's uh, it's about uh, if they if they're going to move it, if we're going to move it, then where do we move it, uh, and and how do we make it the day that we do celebrate? Yeah, you know, so uh, even the Aboriginals who who are not happy about the twenty sixth will uh, will say that, that it's survival. We celebrate our survival, and that's and that is a good thing to celebrate. Absolutely, and so. In, in the culture and the languages, and, and look at the Aboriginal art. You know, you travel anywhere in the world, and, like I do, and well, I used to before COVID. Uh, and you go to um, New York, and you're in a law firm there, and you see Aboriginal art on the wall. And you go to London, and you see the same thing in those corporate buildings, and that. And, and you see exhibitions in Paris and things. So, so we've got a, a great ancient uh, uh, First Nation culture here. Uh, we've got this incredible look, and, and look the institutions we inherited from the British, uh, like uh, uh, liberal democracy, elections, uh, uh, freedoms, uh, rights, uh, uh, and, and uh, the rule of law and and uh, the judicial system we have. Uh, 
they are, are, are good institutions because even because they know how to correct themselves. Even judges who sometimes think they're God have an appeal process in that system because you could have because they acknowledge they could have made mistakes in regard mm. to the first decision. So they so they do. And 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 you look at how the legislator uh, you know, in each of the states and territories in the in the national parliament have you know really amended. Things you know, like I said earlier, you know, it was Robert Menzies in 1962 who extended the voting rights uh, across Australia to uh, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, before that, it was there was a hotchpotch of Aboriginals could vote, especially if they served in the military after the Second World War. And other, in other states like Queensland and Western Australia, they you couldn't vote in all that. In, in New South Wales and Victoria, you could vote. Western Australia, uh, I mean, South Australia, you could vote as too. So he sorted all that mess out, and it was because of the uh, the structure of the Westminster legislature that we inherited, it was able to be fixed. Same with the 67 referendum. Uh, we went through that, and uh, and that ch that fixed those parts of the constitution which were discriminatory, but also uh, it fixed the parts that gave the federal government, because prior to that, the federal government had no power to uh, make laws for Aboriginal people, and that fixed that. And then, uh, and then very quickly after that, uh, we had uh, Neville Bonner in Parliament. And now look at today, there's every Parliament in Australia is virtually got Aboriginal sitting in that Parliament, and uh, and, and you've got local government. I, I was a deputy mayor in Dubbo, and that. So, so things are really moving ahead. Yeah, I agree. When and I see this with the institutions, especially, and I think that. You know, a benchmark for any kind of successful uh, liberal democracy has to be the strength and purity of its institutions. I wonder if the people like Get Up and these kind of radical groups um, are actually causing more harm in terms of preventing people from seeing some of the stuff that you've just expressed in terms of success for the Aboriginal people. And the reason I bring that up in the same sentence as institutions is typically these people do not uh, have much faith or respect for institutions either. That's, that's correct. They go sort of hand in hand. And this is one of the things that I worry about in regard to changing the date and, and, and not having a celebration. Every nation's they have, around the world, they have celebrations of their nation and how, and not one of them are perfect. Every one of those nations around the world have had issues and had problems about how they over a hundred year period or two hundred year period in our case. But they were, they, but they had those. But un, some of them are still got problems. But they don't have what we inherited, mm -hmm. and that is that these institutions which. Uh, have been uh, that would have helped us, uh, you know. Like, uh, look at look at all the Aboriginals now. As I said, in the in the legislators all over around Australia, and you know, in fact, in Northern Territory, we're the chief minister, and in Western Australia, uh, the second most powerful person in any government is the treasurer, and we had Ben Wyatt in Western Australia. So, so we're getting into this space. I, I just find it a bit hard to take that they're going out there and tear, they want to tear down these institutions mm. just when these institutions have corrected themselves and also uh, we've become a, a, a strong part of the uh, of the Australian community now. Yeah, and to sort of take it to America as well, if you look at the, uh, with slavery, um, you know, that was a horrible thing. Slavery has existed, it still exists, but it's existed throughout history. Uh, the American institutions fix that yes it did they didn't it did. it. in fact they, they, they even went the war over it and, and you know four hundred something like four hundred six hundred thousand i don't know the exact number but it was massive because more people got killed in that war trying to free the slaves than every war since then mm. uh, of americans and and, uh, and and it was it was the and, and it was a constitution that gave that when you this is what they always talk about the great experiment is America and, and it is when you actually look at those words that was in 1776 uh, when they got their constitution up uh, you know every man 
it was men that was the word they used, but it meant every person, uh, uh, you know, have the, 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 have these rights. And even though at the time there were a large proportion of the population didn't have those rights, it was, people were able to use those words from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution yep. to fix that. They were able to, if they didn't have those words, they didn't have those in, uh, independent papers or the constitution, they couldn't have fixed it. But with having those, they were able to do that. It gave pa uh, power to Lincoln to, to be able to, uh, to to put in there the ending of slavery and, and, and making uh, 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 black Americans uh, citizens and the right to vote and own property and so on. And it was because of those very words in the beginning of, of, of that, because it was a great experiment, you know, and America is a great experiment. And on the other side of the coin, just to finish up on, I have written about this um, across the last maybe five years. I, I wrote for it when I was a Catholic journalist, and obviously there's certain areas of the church that are invested in uh, many aspects of uh, Indigenous well-being. Um, however, I would often get quite a few comments of straight up, there's no such thing as invasion, you know, this, this, this other side of it. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about uh, the realities of, of what happened on that, that day and f f subsequently afterwards. Uh, yeah, well, I, I understand why people are coming from because, it, but what, you know, you've got a bunch of people, you know, we're, uh, we're here a few thousand years or, or more. And, and all of a sudden the ships turn up and and uh, these soldiers get off the ships and the convicts and that and they start taking over your, over your land and your country, you know. Uh, I don't know what else you could call it with, with that process, you know. Yeah, OK, I'm happy you're here. My family's been here for generations and all of a sudden there's people turn up and they just told us to get out. And uh, you know, it's not like someone moved into your house and and then and, uh, uh, and just took over the, took over your house. You, you can't. Call, I don't know what other word you can use in that regard. But and I don't think we should shy away from it. We we must have a, an honest discussion. You know, like I'm I'm doing some work on uh, on a couple of documentaries at the moment. One of them we're going to look at the Mile Creek Massacre, a dreadful murdering of Aboriginal people and what happened there. Uh, it was horrible. But at the same time, we talk about institutions. The Attorney General of New South Wales actually then charged the 11 people who did that uh, massacre, and seven of them were hung. Uh, so, you know, there, so if people forget about that last bit, <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and, and the, uh, the justice. And so, uh, you know, it, it's so. That, this is what we've got to we've got to confront. You know, the good the good part is it's terrible. You know, those people had to be hanged because they did this dreadful crime, and and it was just and what happened to those Aboriginal people was just you know you read the documentation and you just sort of go oh my god you know they were chopped up and set on fire and dreadful stuff done, but at the end of the day it uh, the uh, the legal system the justice system worked, and. Uh, it, uh, you can't overturn what happened. It, it happened, and but you know, for, but you can uh, try and correct those things as best as you can uh, mm -hmm. through that law. Yeah, and I think that's why. Uh, sorry, go ahead. And so, and this is why I worry about because you know, the people who uh, do lead these uh, uh, demonstrations and stuff like that, uh, they want to tear down. The, they call it the colonial structures. What are you going to put in their place? I believe that, you know, we... Look, nothing's perfect, uh, you know, but as I said, the legal system has a way of correcting itself through the legislator changing the laws and improving on the laws and the court system going through that appeal process. OK, we may have made mistakes in the beginning, but we fix it by having the appeal system that goes up to the high court. Now, what are you going to replace that with? Because I can't think of anything... Uh, you know, I thought I'd take your Churchillian approach to it. You know, we've we, we tried many governments and, and governs ways throughout history, mm. uh, but you know, and in, in, prob in probably the um, 
the, the liberal democracy is probably the worst until you look at all the rest, you know, and, it, yes. and it's true, you know. We do make mistakes, we do, but we do work on correcting those things. And that's what I, and this is why uh, I, I worry about it, because what are you going to replace? What other system are you going to be putting here if you're, going to, if you're talking about ter- tearing it down? I don't think they have thought that far ahead. I think it's <laughs> largely driven by emotion. And this is why I see uh, ide- idealistic, you know, they want to fit in this group. I imagine there's a lot of moral psychology involved in, in these sorts of groups. But they, they latch onto things uh, like deaths in custody, right? Yeah. Now, well, like, sorry, go ahead. No, I'd like you to talk about that. Well, well one of the things that we, we want to confront in regards to the deaths in custody is that uh, they talk about the 437 people, I think it is, I could be wrong, uh, who died uh, in custody. And uh, But when you look at this, I remember a friend of mine approached me and said, oh, my God, he said, oh, what the police and the corrective services officers have murdered these people. And I said, no, they haven't. It's the definition of how they do. So, for instance, some of the deaths, are, you know, a handful of the deaths are like some Aboriginal police people, the police come along and wanted to arrest them and they tried to escape and uh, and fell in a river and drowned. You know, that you can't blame the police for that, yeah. uh, or they f- fell off a building and was drowned or was hit by a car, or they were in a stolen car racing away and had an accident, and, and people like in North Queensland there with that car load of young Aboriginal kids all died, they hit a telegraph pole, yeah. uh, and, the, and, and, and a lot of people are in the prison systems so had died from heart attacks, uh, 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 old age, unfortunately, because they've been in and out of uh, jails all their life, uh, and, uh, and and murdered by other prisoners, and uh, drug overdoses within the system. So when you look at all that, most you know, well, you know, you go out and get a figure of something right up into the nineties of, of that, and then you look at the few cases, and, and I, I, I've identified about six cases where you know there was uh, you know serious questions about. Uh, what the police or the corrective officers did in that space. The Mr Ward situation with Australia is a good example where they drove four hours to transporting this prisoner and didn't check on him. And, uh, and, and so they're driving across a desert uh, and the air conditioner broke down and he was roasted alive in that. That that is a that's a serious issue. Absolutely. And then you look at look at the um, uh, uh, the John Pat situation at Roeburn, but where he was beaten, the, the coroner said he was beating, beaten to death and he had so many bruises and so many... So, and uh, and when you see the description of what happened, you know, the police officers and that what they did to him, then that's a serious, you know, that's murder, really. In fact, I had judges tell me that. And so there are cases of that, but it's only a small percentage. All, case, all deaths are not are not welcome, but it's a small percentage of the overall thing. So let's focus on the real issue, and the real issue is why were people in jail in the first place? Right. Why Why were they being arrested? And then we can start, you know, uh, fixing that up. Now, for instance, I've, I've sat on a number of inquiries over the years and chaired the inquiry in South Australia into, into reoffending. 70% of crime is reoffending, so if we can focus on stopping reoffending, then that will that will do two things. One, we won't have people going to jail, and two, uh, we won't have victims uh, going into the future. And the the other, the other part is it really starts in the juvenile detention centre. So we've got a really do a reform process through there, because they it's almost like a training ground. Any, anyone involved in in criminal justice will tell you it's like a training yeah. ground, and. There, and then if, if, if we put uh, 80% of those kids will go on and, and commit bigger crimes and end up in the adult prison system in and out for the rest of their life. And so we, we, so we must look at better ways of doing these things. I'm hearing a lot of positivity here. I think that uh, we, we don't need to necessarily react to the noise each year of people jumping up and down, uh, rather focus on, on what's being done well uh, a focus on on the strengths of the institutions and the strengths of 
uh, a collective Australia, for a lack of a better term, that, that isn't divided by political ideology. Uh, well, you go to other countries in the world, you know, you look at some of these communist countries where you don't have freedoms at all. In Australia, no matter who you are, you have these incredible freedoms of movement, freedoms of, of course, COVID's put a bit of a... Changed a little bit. ...on some things in a moment, a little bit. But, but you know, normally we, we have this freedom of movements, freedom of uh, speech, uh, freedom of religion. You, you have freedom of worship. You, you, you can even uh, change your religion. Of, and in some countries over the say, overseas, if you, if you do that, they kill you. Yeah, beheaded. You know, it's part of the yeah, beheaded. It's part of the legal system, and so you know we have these amazing uh, you know freedoms here. So if, when people start getting these emotive talks about ripping these things down, and these things were developed over a five or six hundred year period, mm. uh, and uh, you know it wasn't pretty in some of those cases coming forward, but we've been able to really build a good system here and a good culture, uh, you know. Uh, in Australia, and so it's a. Um, I just, I, I, you know, I get really concerned, and then they're tied up with the grievance of history, the the, the, the weight of grievance of history. I, I was asked that question only a few days ago, and I said, look, we, we've got to stop the grievance of history because you can't change history. History is what it is. It's there. It's just factual. You know, I, you know, I've got a, a, an Irish great grandfather. Now he, you know, I'm sure that him and his mob were fighting with Aboriginals over that period. Mm. But it's not you to carry that burden of that grievance. What it is for you to do is learn that history, learn what happened, and work out ways of moving forward and, and making society better. Warren Mundane, thanks a lot for coming on the program. It's been great to talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. The Nick Holt Podcast.